Malaysian, organized by the Malaysian Heritage and History Club. So, she's going to share the life and music of, of Alfonso Triano. Rachel is the eldest granddaughter of Alfonso. And she started singing before she was born. <laughs> Okay, so she has lots of, uh, she has a great musical heritage. She, <laughs> Rachel has cut two albums. I actually had to uh, Facebook her and I, she actually has done one album called Just Friends that I know of. And she is a premier jazz performer and an accomplished pianist. This is her first presentation about her grandfather, Alfonso Soriano, who we all know was one of the leading lights of Malaysian music. So we are very, very privileged because she says she has never done a talk before. And this is exclusively at Riverine, organized by our very own Malaysian heritage. Did not make it even past the age of one or two. 
because you know they were very poor and some of them were yeah well uh, I know it's hard to see it, right? But that same over there, the youngest of the seven that were documented. So the oldest, the oldest three actually were born in the Philippines and they came with uh, Rufino and January. And then as they traveled, the other three were born in Megan. And then subsequently Alfonso was born in Singapore. So the Soleros of that day, they toured with the Bangsawan company. Uh, they were all musicians as you I'm so sorry, but I actually wrote them all down here next to their names and what instruments they played. Um, Mr. Rufino taught his children all to play the piano, the violin, the multi, the Filipinos. And especially the Soliano family, because that was all they knew. And that was all they did as a family. They would travel together in about summer troop. So when Alfonso was born in Singapore, that's where they settled. They settled and as early as seven, he starts also joining his family members in playing in the Bangsawan. So from the age of seven, he is then, they then travel to Penang uh, in a Bangsawan troop called the Grand Jubilee Opera, which was sponsored by the Shaw Brothers. Some of the Solianos, um, in their hay, they were very popular too. One of them being Mr. Jerry, the late Mr. Jerry Soliano, the oldest brother of Alfonso. He was even labeled the king of jazz in Singapore during his city. Some of the other Solianos that were popular then was also his sister, Irina Queenie, who played and sang piano. She is also mother to Raza Rahman, if some of you know, he was the child prodigy in the 70s and one in Bata Altiani or Bata TV. Um, yes, so all the children were multi-talented. The girls would sing and dance or, and the only um, musician among the girls was Irina. She was known as Queenie because she played a lot of jazz music and they labeled her the Queen of Jazz in her heyday. So they called her Queenie. Apparently she But they all traveled in the troop and they all performed together in the band as a family. So, yeah, here's a rare photo of Alfonso playing the trumpet. He was also not only known for playing the piano, but he played the trumpet and that's his sister there on the piano playing with him. One of a rare family upcoming photograph. The Soliano brothers, the late Mr. Jerry Soliano, who's right here in the middle, and together meeting uh, Louis Armstrong in Singapore. So they were all, you know, spread out over the peninsula, north south, creating music and meeting all these wonderful people in their careers. Okay, going back to Alfonso now, Alfonso was born on the 25th of February, as you can see there. But by the age of 11, he had lost both his parents, his mom and dad. Uh, this photograph is seen, seen here with his elder sister, who now has the sole responsibility of looking after of one's soul. So after his parents had passed away, he now goes to live with his sister. But he has his uh, musical training from his oldest brother, Jerry, who taught him how to play piano. And in those days, uh, the, the teaching methods, you could say, were a little bit draconian. <laughs> because uh, you would hear stories of, of one soul being tied to the piano and stuff like that. So because he was so young, they didn't, they didn't want him to run off to play with his friends when they were traveling in the opera and stuff like that. So, 
you know, they wouldn't, yeah, tie him down or and sometimes made him and that would, that would, was used to discipline him to practice his piano on a daily basis. So, at al already a very young age, he was exposed to Pangsawan music. Pangsawan uh, being um, a traditional theatre, traditional Malay theatre. They play all kinds of uh, Malay folk songs and usually So here Alfonso could have been at least uh, 10 to 11 years old. That's him in his outfit um, going to play for Kang Sawan. That's how the stories he had told me growing up was uh, the fact that they would earn according to the size of the audience in the Kang Sawan days. So when it rained, um, they would earn nothing. Right? Because nobody would come to watch them for shows. And um, but on good nights they could earn like maybe a dollar fifty. Nothing's changed, we're still earning like that. <laughs> According to the size of the audience. But the promoter sometimes the pro promoter would slip in the fifty cents, you know, and yeah, like whisper to like, don't tell anyone it. And then you have a good night, he would do that. He would do that. So, yeah, those are really hard years uh, traveling around and it was not easy because, you know, uh, schooling for him was haphazard. At an early age, he was already traveling up and down. So, when they were in Penang, from Singapore, when they went to Penang to work with the French of Opera, that's where he had his most schooling um, at St. Xavier's institution, actually. So he didn't go very far in school because they were always traveling. He even went to school up in um, places like Parit Punta and Kada and stuff like that. Because that's where the Bangsawan would travel to in those days. Time to think too far. No, no. The Filipinos love giving each other nicknames, you know. They have beautiful names, but they never use their real names, especially among family members. So previously, if you had seen the earlier slide, some of the, the names, they, have, um, they all, all of our sisters had um, Filipino nicknames. For instance, Almanso, they refer to him as Nono. So to his friends and family members, they would call him Nono. And that was really a term of the year, really. And his sisters, um, Josephina, they would call her King King. And his brother, Paulinho, was Tute, you know. So really weird names. We had Uncle Pudding, Uncle Drong, you know, Uncle Tute. But it was all really a very Filipino tradition. I have one, but I shall not reveal. <laughs> Anyway, here he is, always <coughs> very prim and proper, and, uh, and that's the way I remember the So after the Bangsawan years, or as Bangsawan started to taper off um, in the early 40s, Alfonso is now leading his own uh, band. This is taken in Singapore. He's already in his teens, and he's here seen leading his own band. During the Japanese occupation, Alfonso makes his way up to Penang, and and that's where he meets the love of his life. Pasita Jumona. So as a musician, you know, you're never stationary. You're always back and forth. That's why it's really hard to keep track of where he was during your occupation or before. You know, you can never really document it properly. Because they're always struggling. So one minute you're here, the next minute you're there. And so now, we were in Singapore before, and now suddenly he's up in Penang. And in Penang, again, he's with 
the family playing in the Bangsaman Opera during the Japanese occupation. He goes down to Singapore, he leaves his own band, he goes back up to Penang, he plays with other musicians. And then here he is, he meets Hasita Tirona for the first time in his life, working together in the Bangsaman. So always yeah, imbued in um, Malay music, traditional Malay music, he loved it. Pasita Tirona, my late grandmother, there she is on the left. Um, and on the right is Alfonso's sister, the one earlier who played the piano inside. That's her, he died. And of course I've been in her late teens there. So she played the violin and she sang and dance, just like all the other sisters who were in the Bangsawan. They all had to multitask. Yeah. They go on to have 10 children of their own. Um, of course, those days, you know, <laughs> they didn't have Facebook, so they were not instructed. Five girls and five boys. Same like me. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Well done. So they get married first of May, 1948. They actually eloped from Penang to where in Singapore. Um, at that time, um, uh, Pasita was, um, you know, restricted. Her movements were restricted. She, had, she was the eldest of five girls, and her father was very strict with them. And, didn't want her to, uh, to, to marry just yet. So they eloped and they got married in Singapore. Actually, her sisters helped her elope. <laughs> Your family secrets I'm revealing tomorrow you get shot by the one. So that was them in Singapore. Um, none of her sisters attended her wedding, but Alfonso's. Um, Best man was later, you know, um, his set the boy to the band. And his sister and his um, brother in law then. Here's their ten children. Um, also, all now become musicians. Naturally, right? <laughs> what else? And I am one of Francisca. That's my mom over there, the third of ten children. They are all also multi talented. Uh, some of them play painful instruments. One of them is here tonight. My auntie is an alarm. Please put your hands up. <laughs> she is the fourth from the young person. See if we have additional music in the background. <laughs> so in 1948, Alfonso also produces his first musical, uh, his first music soundtrack. And this happened to also be Tirambi's first debut uh, as an actor uh, in the movie called Chinta. So Alfonso was responsible for the orchestration in the movie, in Hirami's first movie called Chinta. So at the age of 23 years old, uh, being married and producing his first um, big venture, I suppose. Very young. In his early age, um, as a musician, in his teens as a musician, he was also exposed to a lot of jazz music already then in the late 40s and early 50s. He starts listening to um, people like Art Tatum and Carl Basie, Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, all the big names in jazz. They were the swing era was booming then, and he now tries to emulate a lot of their music by infusing it into his repertoire. So at that time, when he was 23 years old, Bebop was all the rage in the US. They had already uh, explored Bebop one year prior to, to him introducing it here in Malaya. So when he first played Bebop in Kuala Lumpur, this 
uh, virtuoso on the piano. People maybe didn't take the liking because they could dance to it. Bebop was really a fast and up-tempo um, type of swing. It was more of a listening music as opposed to a dancing kind of music. So even though they didn't understand it um, in the beginning, they, they finally took to it. And they did like it after a while. However, it didn't last very long because they couldn't dance to it. But yeah, it was quite ahead of his time introducing Bebop to the Malaysian audience. 23 years old. So Hongsu is now back in Kuala Lumpur, and that's him there in the middle. Plays in the band of five, sometimes they have two singers, or they have, you know, guest artists always, right? Um, there he is again behind the piano. He's in Kuala Lumpur, and they play in places like um, Salama Club which was called the spotted dog then. Or they called it the dog sometimes. <coughs> as a dog. Um, and also places like Griffin Inn. Um, he played at Griffin Inn quite a bit. But they didn't have many places there. Like clubs and cabarets for you in the city. They probably had three different places. Eden Park, Color Green, Griffin Inn. You know, places like that. So the musicians would always just um, gravitate from one place to another. The jobs are really unsecure. But in 19, in 1951, he starts at the invitation of the artist of Hatsai, um, who was a head of the Malay department in Radio Malaya. Uh, Alfonso is invited to join uh, Radio, Radio Malaya to form a band, uh, and he now is performing part time on radio. I'm sorry, I'm so distracted by the hymn so much. Okay, I'll play you something so you can focus back on. Because at that time, 
all the musicians in town, they were, you know, uh, not really well read. But Alfonso insisted, and he was against the idea, and he insisted that the orchestra be made uh, uh, purely of uh, local musicians. But, that's not me. Ah! Oh, okay. <laughs> so he insisted that the orchestra be made um, uh, of local musicians. But the local musicians, they could not read, right? They couldn't read, a lot of them. Um, so what he did was, he actually copied the audition papers, he gathered some of his friends, and told them, look, you know, if you get this job, you will have more secure jobs. So he copied the audition papers and he made them memorize the parts. So when they came for the audition, they would all pass and they got in the orchestra. So he helped a lot of his friends get in, um, uh, get um, jobs that were most, that were secure on the day. And, um, so he really had his work cut out for him because in order to put an orchestra together, you had to have a, a, a bunch of musicians who could read. Otherwise, you know, it's like going to war with no bullets, right? You're just carrying guns with no bullets. So Alfonso had his work cut out for him. And, uh, but by 1961, Orchestra Regal was already formed and they now officially have 10 orchestra members. So Alfonso has set the tone now for the local music industry in Malaysia. He has raised the bar. He has he has set the scene, basically. You know, um, as opposed to when they were all playing in the clubs, you know, with jobs that are you know unsecured. They now have full-time jobs as musicians, and they have. And he has also like created a snowball effect in the music industry. So these people now, all the musicians in town, we are all excited and we we are looking up to these guys, you know, with um, with great admiration because we didn't have nothing like this before, right? It's so exciting to have the sound of the band. So he worked diligently. He really trained them from scratch basically creating an orchestra out of the desert for all these musicians who couldn't read he had spent time teaching them, coaxing them, training them in all the hours, you know, just to get them to play together. Over the years, uh, Orchids Radio Malaya expands. Uh, some of them were part-timers and then, you know, but they grow in numbers over the years. So this was probably Some of the big names who came out of the orchestra actually were all um, part of the first orchestra that Alfonso had um, put together. And you can see on the far left standing is Dato Dr. Ahmad Nawab. If some of you know who he is. Um, some of the big names on Alfonso's left, uh, like this one. On far right over here, standing Dr. Johani Saleh. So a few of the others as well who, who had gone on to become renowned musicians in the, in the local music industry. So in Alfonso's years as an arranger and composer at RTM, he had um, introduced a lot of jazz elements in his music. But he had also composed a lot of music too. But I think he was very well known for infusing jazz elements into Asli music. For, for example, uh, well, I say Asli music a lot because he was so imbued with uh, Asli music throughout his early life as an entertainer and a performer. So he's always, you know, um, free arranging songs from his childhood days. I'll play you an example, um, an old Asim, um, an old Asim folk song called Lengang Kangkung. I'm sure most of you know what the song is, but this was recorded before Malika.
was now moving with the times at, uh, in the 50s when swing music was all the rage, right? Big Band, like Count Basie, Duke Ellington. Uh, he's adapting all the old Malay classics and making that sound current. And the current music then was swing. And because he had the Big Band, he had now been, uh, he is now introducing uh, big band music, and this is what they look like before playing with Alfonso, sometimes at the piano and sometimes up front conducting the band. So here's a, uh, here's a musician who had never had formal, uh, a proper formal education in music, or even in school, he had only gone up to Senate 4. He is writing scores for a big band, he is teaching all these people how to be and how to play, you know, uh, and he himself had never been exposed to all this this uh, this teaching method. So how he did that is beyond my comprehension. Yes. So that's Radio Malaya in reality. Okay, I'm going to play another uh, Asli song just so you can hear some of the. Have you ever heard of Ayam Nanate? I am Ben Lantan, yes. It's actually a very, very old Asli tune. And there are many variations. I, I checked on Google to find out what, they, what the lyric meant. And one of the, the translation was of a man who's married with four wives and his four wives had left him. <laughs> it's very upset. But that's just one of the, the translations. And this version, the first version I'm going to play you, was recorded by um, a gentleman called Os. Uh, oh, I'll find it for you next. <laughs> I can't. I can't seem to find it. For my notes. Anyway, it was traditionally recorded. This is a traditional recording of it.
um, the music industry is now being exposed to Latin American rhythms. So hence you have the cha-cha, you have the sambas and the bossa novas, um, you know, being infused into the American culture. Um, also the early 60s now, the British has invaded, the British invasion of music has, has uh, taken over the music industry in, in, uh, in America. The Beatles are now famous and so music was evolving and Alfonso had to evolve with the times. So infusing um, Latin American rhythms with our Malay music. That was what he uh, was well known for. So the orchestra is now traveling around the country. They are um, uh, holding concerts around the peninsula because you know they they are exposing themselves to the public. They are the in thing now, the happy thing in Malaysia. They would rehearse for hours and hours on end, and Alfonso was quite a disciplinarian. He would not let them go until they got every note right. So the musicians were all not used to this lifestyle because before the orchestra, they could um, they were all playing by heart and they weren't subject to practicing for hours on end. They didn't have to get up in the morning to come to work and punch card and rehearse. So the whole lifestyle and the whole concept of being a full-time musician is, is completely new to them. So they have actually now raised the bar and set the standard for the musician of the day. It's really quite amazing. Okay, I want to take you back to 1959. 1959 um, is a year and a half shortly after we had uh, gained independence. And um, now, um, Office Radio Malaya is uh, under the species of the Kerala Arts Council, um, decided to hold this concert uh, of Malay music, uh, an evening of Malay music. Um, so this, this is the first time that Malay music is being presented in a symphonic form. However, when, in 1959, we didn't have a full-fledged orchestra. So um, we had to collaborate with our Singaporean counterparts who came up uh, to, make, um, uh, to make up the whole orchestra in order to play um, uh, Malay music in a symphonic form. To have a full-fledged orchestra um, at that time was not possible because they didn't have enough musicians on, uh, in Orchestra Radio Malaya then. So this is the first time that Alfonso had um, written a full symphonic score of Asli music. So Asli music has never been heard on a full-scale orchestra before. Okay, it has always been played in a small combo like that before and also they've heard it now on a, in a big band song but it's never been played in a full symphony uh, style. Um, here Alfonso introduces his Asli um, Abadi Overture and it consists of five songs uh, in a medley. Uh, they are Nasib Panjang, Lanchang Kuning, Putri Basiram, Selengang Mat Inam, and Johor Sports Club. Now, the overture is very, very long. It's about, it's close to 12 minutes. So I'm not going to play you the whole thing. I'm just going to let you hear a minute of it. This was the original program of the Malamira Malaysia, which they had in 1965. This is also the cover of the recording that they had in 
semi male. He was uh, he loved having big big parties. He loved he had a well, he had ten children. <laughs> you know, he was very family oriented. And this um, this family consciousness um, spilled over into his leadership as a, an orchestra conductor with his musicians. He not only um, uh, treated them like, like uh, brothers, he, they were like, fam I mean, he treated them like family. They were always in and out of our houses. And, you know, as a little child, I was exposed to all these musicians coming to the house all the time. You know, the house was always still. So he didn't, it was not with only a business-like relationship with him. He cared deeply for all these musicians. Them like family. And you can see here that he was a well loved leader. They loved him. The guys that worked for him, they really loved him. Some of them here, well, one very well known uh, singer here he discovered. Uh, you can see over there on your far, on my far left, is Tan Sri S.M. Salim. Tan Sri S.M. Salim. Um, also, Mr. Ahmad Nawab. Uh, on the left of uh, SM Salim over there. And all the music is uh, too many to mention now. In 1965, um, Alfonso came under heavy pressure uh, by the local press because they deemed his music to be too Western oriented. And they even went to the extent of labeling him Katiak uh, Barat, which translates to be uh, you know, under the armpit of the West. Um, as a musician who had worked so many years to now build this orchestra and spend all these hours working, he was producing um, music and records um, at an outrageous pace in their, day, in their heyday, you know. For hours on end, he worked to nurture the, the musicians and he had changed and revo revolutionized the music industry by creating this, this um, I am not so words, but anyway, what he did was, you know, was unheard of in his day. Now, coming under heavy criticism, um, laden with office uh, politics and uh, you know even the pressure and uh, of uh, you know changing a uh, suggestion of changing his fate even he has now decided to uproot his family and children to Bangkok. This was taken on the uh, farewell dinner that they had for him in Antia. So, the people who know nothing about music are the ones always talking about it. Apparently, Ned and Cole had the same problem with the press, huh? So Alfonso now moves to Bangkok uh, in 1965. He leaves the uh, RPM. And he is big in Bangkok. In Bangkok, he is now playing at the American uh, Officers Club, Chao Kya American Officers Club. And it is here that he gets to meet all, um, all the great American artists that come to visit the American officers and entertain them. And his job of the day was to, to back them all up. So all the stars that came through Bangkok, like Sarah Vaughan, Billy Daniels, Bill Eckstein, Jimmy Witherspoon, Anita O'Day, Pat Boone, Debbie Boone, the original platters. And here you have <laughs> Alan Brando, right smack in the head. So all these, um, all these wonderful um, superstars of the day that come from Bangkok, he was now uh, backing them up. Um, so here in 
time for the lifestyle, you know, the musician. Very glamorous and, and very hectic. He was holding two jobs at the time. He was playing at the Cat's Eye Bar and also at the American Office Club. Here in the Cat's Eye Bar, um, he was, um, he made friends with uh, a gentleman called uh, the Tamlan, right? And this is his, um, uh, this is where he's now introduced to play music. Um, Mr. Changnan is part of the Thai Music Association, and Mr. Changnan now introduces him to the king of Thailand, and this is where he now uh, has a relationship with the Thai musicians, and they play every once a month for the king of Thailand. Yeah, his repertoire then also consisted of Thai music. In 1966, the Malaysian government decided to award Officer uh, Soliano with the AMN. Now, I googled this for you because <laughs> some of you may not know what AMN means. Uh, in English, it is um, equivalent to Order of the Defender of the Realm. Yeah. It is a federal award presented for meritorious service to the country. However, Alfonso refused to come back to KL to receive this award. And he is seen here receiving the award from the uh, Malaysian ambassador in the Malaysian embassy in Bangkok. So here they are, living the life of debauchery. <laughs> Musicians, you know, um, always entertaining, always having big parties. He loved that. And they were always, always uh, filled. The house was always filled with people. People that we didn't even know walked through the house because he was just that sort of a man, you know. All the musicians were so friendly with him, all the Filipino musicians that were in Bangkok at that time. They didn't have a place to stay, they would end up in Solia residence. So um, Alfonso was very close to the late Judy Boyer. They had a very close relationship. And here he is in the bottom with the Colonel Stokes who was um, the man who was running the Champia American Officers Club. And Colonel Soaps was the one who had encouraged Alfonso to play a lot of his, to play more original tunes. So he encouraged Alfonso to play more of his own music. In 1969, the King of Thailand awards Alfonso uh, a golden record, of course, for a uh, foreigner, for best arranger of the year for his contribution to Thai music. So uh, here's Alfonso receiving the award from King Bumibo. And that's the tourist. Um, so we have him there. Yeah, so he is doing well in that hall. Also at the um, American, uh, also at Cat's Eye he was spotted by a German fellow, I forget his name. I wrote it down, I can't, I can't find it, sorry. And he has, he's now, he's been invited to participate in a, in a German jazz festival. So he now leads a, 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 musician, a band of 10 musicians um, to participate in a jazz festival in Germany. Um, those days for Asian musicians, but this gentleman was so impressed with his play and um, he had requested for Alfonso to come to lead his own band and when he got there he was he participated in a month long of jazz workshops and um, he also uh, played and appeared on German television um, featuring his own music so he really experimented with a lot of uh, uh, new sounds and this is the result of one of his compositions. <laughs>
Germany. When he got there in Germany, he had no idea what, they had, what was expected of him. The Germans told him that they wanted him to play avant-garde jazz. He didn't even know what the term meant, avant-garde jazz. It means jazz, it means, uh, music of jazz that's ahead of the times. So they put him in a room and they gave him all these records to listen to and, and he came up with his compositions and that was one of them. It was, you know, for him to produce something that he had no idea of, and you know, he managed to impress the Germans. It was um, quite a feat at the time. So they were very happy, and as a result, the, the program is also aired in Asia. The Malaysian government um, requested for Alfonso to come back home. So, um, at the request of the Malaysian government, uh, especially Information Minister and uh, uh, the late country Ghazali Shaki, uh, had gone up to Bangkok to convince Alfonso so they would come back. You know. uh, his reason was that the country needed him, so he spends a whole month thinking about it, whether he should come back. And finally, he decides to come back after a month because home is where the heart is. So when upon return from Bangkok, he is now made arranger and senior musician of uh, orchestra at the end. He continues in the 70s to play for dignitaries, that's the great Mutun uh, Abu Razak there in the middle, play for dignitaries and produce material for um, orchestra at the end. We play in concert for Dana, also stuff like that. He also produces an award-winning album in 1978 called The Late Lato Sherpa Aini and Hamza Nomad called Lila Manja. This was a groundbreaking album at that time because it was uh, also asking music um, presented uh, in, uh, in 1978. It was unusual for for Sherpa, I would be singing So the, the album goes on to win um, Album of the Year by Seniman, Persatuan Seniman, Malaysia. And sorry, I'm, I'm so sorry, it's so tiny. In the same year, um, also Alfonso also um, wins uh, the title of producer and Composer of the year for that particular album. The same year that Salma was picked as Ijuan Nagara. And what a coincidence because Saloma, the, uh, the TV program is also uh, debuting tonight on Astro. <laughs> so the same night we are talking about Alfonso. In that same year, Alfonso suffered a stroke. It was quite a major stroke in 1978. So that set him back quite a bit. Uh, he laid off work and he did return until in the early 80s. So in the early 80s, he goes back to Arkham in 83. He starts uh, playing music again. But this time, you know, not producing as much. Still arranging for them. Uh, here it is, just uh, returning after his stroke. That's one of the last photos taken with his wife. Okay, the Soliano clan. <laughs> so many of them. They were also really introduced uh, to the Malaysian music scene in the 70s, the Solianos. You see them here with the late Zain Azman and Kwanshi uh, Saloma singing in a television program in uh, RTM. So they are already introduced to the Malaysian public. And that was what we, I was exposed to when I was a kid, always music in the house. Um, hence, me being a musician as well. And the Solianas in their early 70s over there. They go on to uh, conquer the music scene around Kuala Lumpur and sometimes 
around the country. Also, again, in a TV, a special TV program <laughs> on, on the left with the late Salomashi, it's not a program in Christmas. Uh, all the Solianos over there in uh, a special TV, Christmas TV program. Recently, the Solianos at one uh, was, uh, was awarded the Guinness Book of Records for being the longest performing family ensemble in the country. And that's the Solianos today. They are currently performing at the Majestic Hotel where the late Omoto Soliano had also been the first musician to perform it. And that is one month later my grandfather had passed away after that photograph. And uh, June 16, 1990, um, the country had lost one of its greatest musicians. And I, I actually would like to, I, I would actually like to read a quote by uh, Saida Rastam. Uh, Nathan Saida Rastam is a celebrated composer and musician. Um, and she had recently uh, like I explained earlier on, she had recently been uh, here as well at Pantamara's talk and she is releasing a book on um, eight local Malaysian composers next month but this is what she had to say of uh, Mono. In Peter Carey's classic novel Oscar and Lucinda, the hero promised the heroine that he would build her an impossible thing a massive cathedral made entirely of glass to be transported by river into the Australian outback. This is the kind of task that was asked by the government of Nono and he delivered that. So I'm going to play one of his most famous compositions to cap off the evening. This one was uh, recorded by the late um, Zane Asmat. This one is called Radis in Gaman. <laughs> Uh, they get 
to experience his love all over again. So I'm going to leave you with uh, Daddy's Ija And um, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Bert, for challenging me to do this my first time here. <laughs>
Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the time for having us here this evening. We hope you enjoy the music. If you want to purchase them, I brought some CDs with me. So I'd like to have a conversation with you after this. Thank you.